there we go. So you heard it here first. Um, web package, due date, switch till Wednesday, sorry, Thursday, November 8th to give you a chance to vote. Um, <clears throat> obviously, I'm still not better, so sorry about that. It's a bit of a bummer to get lectured to by somebody who's tired and sick. Uh, let's just see here. So, we last class we talked about the next leg of our reporting assignment, which is the final leg of it, which is to rewrite the TV package, which was based on your radio feature to rewrite it as a web package. Um, and so basically, you, the same bit of reporting has served you for the radio feature, the television package, and now the web package. And uh, you will uh, be supplying me with a, a, a number of different pieces. So that's what I wanted to look at again with you, as to what, the, what composes the web package, what it's made up of. Um, and I can also offer you the, uh, an alternative, because sometimes at this point in the game, people are tired of their topic. Maybe they chose a topic which doesn't lend itself to uh, um, you know, the type of work that I'm asking for in the web package. So I do supply an alternative that we could take a look at today as, um, as part of this. So. Um, we will jump into that in a second, a little later in the class. Um, the textbook reading stuff that we uh, have taken a look at last class. Let's take a, a quick review of it. And uh, in fact, I think it's probably already downloaded. <clears throat> quick review, and maybe we can discuss just a little bit about it, perhaps. Let's see what you think. So the reason why I put in chapter 9 at this point, writing for traditional print news products, is because when we're back writing for the web, we're writing in um, a format which is familiar to us from traditional print news writing. Um, so uh, there are differences in story structure from the broadcast diamond structure or circle, which is what the textbook calls it, the same thing if you ask me, uh, to going to the inverted pyramid of the text or traditional print structure of a story. Um, understand why the sources are important, so we can look at that and then apply attributions to direct and indirect quotes. So attribution in broadcast, as we saw, is just naming the person that we're going to hear in their sound bite. Um, in print, it's we pretty much want to copy that over and make sure that people understand that our quotes, who's saying our quotes. But also in print, uh, we're using indirect quotes, which is paraphrases that are drawn from uh, your interviews that you are saying, you are putting them into words, which is to make sure that, um, that you're doing it in a way which is responsible and best industry practice. So print writing relies heavily on the inverted pyramid. We talked about that. Um, it requires you to write in shorter paragraphs, and we saw that when writing for the web, two or three sentence paragraphs are, you know, standard. So keep your paragraphs short. You may have blocks of text in your television package that um, when you rewrite them for the web, they're going to be uh, in shorter paragraphs. And then, you know, uh, as, as you work, try to um, keep opinion separate from uh, fact. In broadcasting, because of its conversational style, we may slip in a little bit more personality and um, opinion into a factual piece, but in um, print writing, you know, you want to distinguish what you're doing from, for instance, a blog, which could be really, really personalized. Um, so, got a little video here about um, the 
inverted pyramid type of structure. I haven't put my links in exactly right. So here we go, inverted pyramid. I just Hello and welcome to this video tutorial on the inverted pyramid style of writing. Ooh. I'm going to explain what the inverted so. pyramid is, the benefits of this style, and how to write in this way. With its origins in journalism, this method of starting with your conclusion is called the inverted pyramid style. It is used both in journalism and in writing for the web. It can also be called front-loading your content. It means you should put your most important information first. This structure is called an inverted pyramid simply because it is an upside-down pyramid with the most important information at the top and the least important information at the bottom. Starting with your conclusion when writing for the web has many benefits. Readers can quickly assess the value of your content and can decide whether they want to stay on your page and read your entire article. Readers can stop reading at any position and still come away with your main point. With this structure, the first few sentences on your web page will contain most of your relevant keywords. This will boost your search engine optimization. If you also front load each paragraph, you allow your readers to skim through the first sentences of every paragraph to get a quick overview of your entire article. Journalists are taught to write news stories in this inverted pyramid style. They front load their story, putting the essential and most attention grabbing elements first, followed by supporting or explanatory information the least important information is at the bottom. This style allows newspaper readers to skim their newspapers for a quick news update. They can choose to read only part way through an article, knowing that the information they fail to read at the end is not going to be as important as the information at the beginning. This style also has the advantage of allowing editors to chop off the bottom of articles at any point so that the story will fit into the required space on a newspaper page. When the least important information is at the bottom, articles can be easily shortened by editors without damaging the structure of the story. Front loading is different to the style you were taught in school or university for essay writing. To write an essay, you start with an introduction and you gradually build up to your conclusion. To write effectively for the web, you need to do the opposite and come to the point immediately. This style calls for a very direct approach. If you spoke in this manner, it might be considered blunt and perhaps a little rude. But it is the preferred style for internet users. So be direct. Make your point first, then explain it. Research has shown that by front-loading your web content, you are more likely to keep your readers on the page. Today's internet users are impatient for results. If they cannot quickly and easily assess your article for points of interest, they are likely to leave your web page and go search for an alternative that is easier to skim and scan. So uh, what did you think about the benefits that were uh, associated with the inverted pyramid? Did you, do you feel that um, either the, the ability to assess what's on a web page when you first land on it and also the ability to check out any time you want having got the essential, do you feel that that's worthwhile compared to with what we were doing in broadcasting? Can skip to any part of this. News. So you can skip to any part of the story. Just what the subheadings. what allows us to skip to any part of the story? Subheadings. Sorry, the subheadings, right? Yeah. 
So they, they mentioned, she said, you know, front load your paragraphs, but these could equally be, instead of paragraph, topic sentence, right, subheads. Absolutely, Chow. So, so you're saying that, uh, that this, doing it this way makes it easy for people to navigate within your story, to go from one subhead to another to another. That makes, that makes good sense. Uh, focusing in on the beginning of the story, however, uh, you know, what the, uh, what the video was saying is by putting your main point up front at the very beginning, you allow uh, a reader to assess and say, is this worth it? Should I spend time with it? Is that how you read pages? Like when you hit them on, when you land on a page, is that how you're likely to, to judge whether you want to stay with it? No comment? <laughs> okay. Uh, how about this notion that she brought up as well, that uh, the beginning of your story uh, <clears throat> not only helps human beings assess what it is that they're going to read and see if they want to spend time with it, but it also is packed full of the keywords that help search engine optimization. Are you... Uh, do you think that's an important thing for your story to get read, for people to find it? Yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And so it used to be that web pages could be kind of tricked out or loaded with keywords. Um, they could, for instance, put a whole pile of keywords in white on white or make them so tiny that no one would, human being would ever see them, but basically, you could load up a page full of keywords that uh, were going to rate the page highly uh, in internet searches uh, based on um, you know, how popular those words are. And how it's a dozen hashtags at the bottom of your Instagram post. That's part of it, yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's the visible part. The other part is the algorithms of you know, Facebook or Instagram or Google which are largely, um, you know, hidden from us so that we can't figure out how to fool them. Right? So, uh, yeah, search engine optimization, SEO, uh, depends on many things. In Google, it's based on uh, how many links point to your page on the assumption that the more useful your page is, the more people will link to it or go to it. Uh, the useless pages, no one will bother, you know, uh, linking to them or going there. So what it surfaces is uh, the, uh, the most linked pages. And SEO, that part of it, uh, Google also tracks um, keywords. So words that trend, for instance, you can even find these in Google Trends, which is a service that they provide to anybody. You can enter in, you know, uh, Donald Trump, and you can see how many million searches have looked up Donald Trump. Um, so the search engine optimization means getting those words into your story and into, into the first part of your story. Um, so uh, it tends to work together. If you put in a lead which contains the most important material for your story early on, it's going to contain the keywords. And it's going to inform the human that's reading your story about you know, what's in the story for you to assess. <clears throat> because we know that readers often stop and move on to something else, it's good that you put stuff up front so that they read it. And then um, they've read the essential, even if they move on later. So it's an old print thing, but it still, it still works well for the web. Uh, I kind of didn't agree with this formula. Like when I go on uh, online articles, I, I tend to uh, I tend to like leap if it doesn't really get to the point. Yeah, good point. It's yeah. like it's like maybe five sentences, and all right, I'm just kind of uh, mentally fell asleep on the next one. I'm like that too, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I may like skim down a little bit and see if I can reach what it is that's really important, and then pff, gone. Yeah, good point. Bro. That is how I read too. Um, cool. So, heading over. Uh, 
quotes. So your story is composed of quotes that you have pulled from your interview. Um, you wrote them in as actualities or SOTs. It's just that that's the sound bites. Uh, now what you'll do is you'll go into your script and you'll pull out those sound bites and turn them into quotes. Um, so there's a, a lot of talk in print writing about direct quotes, indirect quotes, and how to handle them. Uh, and so, um, you know, the difference, a direct quote is obviously would be an SOT or an actuality. It came from, you know, the mouth of your uh, interview and it's the exact words and in broadcasting we would, you know, edit in a clip of somebody saying something and that would be our, our SOT, right? The indirect quote uh, is something that you paraphrase and so this is you know the interconnecting passages in your television package let's say where they contain information is largely a paraphrase from what you have learned from your interview or perhaps an, another source of additional information so uh, this is where you can you know they may have taken forever to say something important and you boil it down for them and then, you know, there's a mixture of the two uh, in which you can, for instance, stitch together two quotes, direct quotes that were said five minutes apart. You can put them together with, you know, a little joiner uh, that you write, a little bit of paraphrase in the middle, and start to concoct, you know, really informative and efficient paragraphs that are composed of... Uh, of direct quotes and paraphrases. So um, we saw, um, I should have put a link to the NBC Investigates story that we looked at last time. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, you'll see this at work in, yeah, it was in the toxic, toxic wastewater story, but um, you'll see these types of compound quotes, right? For instance, right there, with the help of Weegis, who is the lawyer of those two farmers who sued uh, the energy company, the Stars waged a 13-year battle against Era Energy in court. Uh, and then you can stitch together two SOTs, again, which may have come quite a long way apart, but uh, you can, you can, condense it in a way that you couldn't really do in video editing. It was, it was harder to do that. So, so this is a nice aspect of print. Right? And uh, <clears throat> so there's this video resource on direct versus indirect quotes, which are, um, you know, you know, I mean, what, without dipping into the video, which is basically like a PowerPoint, but it's informative, but it's also equally dull compared to me talking. But uh, so what would you think of would be a, a benefit of a direct quote versus an indirect quote? Get the full information. Yeah, you get the information from the source's mouth. This is exactly what they said. Um, it's always possible to quote somebody out of context. That's a pretty... You know, uh, common occurrence is like, um, so there's a limitation to that of direct quotes. And then indirect quotes, what do you think is useful about them? The paraphrasing part is an indirect quote. Uh, it lets you summarize like larger concepts. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. William. So, you know, again, they may have taken a minute and a half to say something. You know your readers just want to know quickly what the big picture is and you can summarize it. So, you know, then we count on the journalists as doing an accurate paraphrase for us. But uh, it is, um, I'd say those are the main benefits and, and, and uh, drawbacks of each. So that's a real good point, definitely. Um, <clears throat> there's also, uh, um, well, let's head further on here into back into slide land basically um, web. whoops no that's the wrong one sorry folks just putting putting more detail into this notion of the inverted pyramid like what comes in each section of it um, 
I'd say again, we've always been saying this, the lead is the most important part of your story. In this case, if we're going to follow the advice of putting the main information into the start of the story, you know, your lead is going to contain, you know, your point of view on the story and the five W's, the one H, try to get it all within the first three, four sentences of your story so that people really understand it. Um, and then you move into the explanation. As the video said, first make your point, then explain background and so on and so forth. So this is where I wanted to get to here because it follows on from what we were talking about. So you know, basically what you're doing is you're moving through uh, direct quotes and then paraphrased indirect quotes and you're basically moving the story along that way as you did in your TV package. You know. um, and then the end is the story is looking forward to what might happen next. Um, so you can summarize what's happened. You can look forward to next steps. An encapsulating quote sometimes is a nice thing where, you know, the way you're going to end the story uh, has a conclusion or, you know, a summary aspect to it. So I think, yes, last class when we looked in at... Uh, our story about the stars, uh, you know, look at where we go here. Eventually we're to Larry Starr, who's one of the kids, uh, son of, you know, the family that um, has had their groundwater polluted by this energy company. He says, I really do blame our regional water board for a lot of it because they have the power to shut it down, Larry said. They had a power stop and they didn't do any of that. So that's, you know, the the takeaway in that case, the encapsulating quote is that they may have won their court case, but um, their water's polluted and they're still mad at the regional water board for not doing anything. So. <clears throat> in this case, we're not expecting something to develop on the story. Um, so instead, we're getting kind of encapsulating quotes at the end. So this is what's happened. See if anyone is in this chat. Hi guys. Oh, sorry. It seems like the streaming. Nat Natalia is saying the streaming is stopping all the time. Let us know if it's getting any better, Natalia. Okay. So I think those are the main points that are um, pertinent to uh, to our um, chapter here, which where we've been, we've been taking basically. The main points of writing for print and seeing how they are still important and influencing us when we write for, for the web. Um, the big three, relying on sources, avoid repetition, flavor with care, which I believe refers to maintaining an objective tone. <laughs> so, uh, 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 you know, again, if you're doing a profile and you think the person you profiled is the most wonderful person in the world, um, you want to have uh, your sources saying that, not necessarily yourself, um, in order to maintain an objective uh, stance, I guess. Um, so I think that's what is meant by flavor with care. Uh, keep, your, keep your opinion um, <clears throat> sort of uh, cordoned off from, from the factual aspect of it, and, and you're hoping to find actual sources who will tell you the information and stuff. Yeah. All of this is done by you already in your TV package. Um, if your package failed to bring in a second source, now it would be a good time to bring in, you know, to do that work and bring in a second source so that your sourcing is uh, complete. And um, let us just pause for a second and look into this issue of sources, um, where I did find um, something of importance. Okay. I hope it's a real call and not no. spam. It was my alarm. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's just check out this, what's said about sourcing here. Oh, I'm sorry. I muted it uh, at the, the end of it. It has $500 in it. To a college student, I practically struck the lottery. Keep in mind that this
this was five hundred dollars. How do you know what's happening in, in your world? Time. Did I think someone was the amount of information just a clip? One sec. I've got another tab with something else going on. Okay, here, over here. Good Lord, where are we? Okay, exit full screen. Up we go. What else is playing here? This one. Start again. How do you know what's happening in your world? The amount of information just a click away may be limitless, but the time and energy we have to absorb and evaluate it is not. All the information in the world won't be very useful unless you know how to read the news. To your grandparents, parents, or even older siblings, this idea would have sounded strange. Only a few decades ago, news was broad-based. Your choices were limited to a couple of general interest magazines and newspapers of record, and three or four TV networks, where trusted newscasters delivered the day's news at the same reliable time every evening. But the problems with this system soon became apparent as mass media spread. While it was known that authoritarian countries controlled and censored information, a series of scandals showed that democratic governments were also misleading the public, often with media cooperation. Revelations of covert wars, secret assassinations, and political corruption undermined public faith in official narratives presented by mainstream sources. This breakdown of trust in media gatekeepers led to alternative newspapers, radio shows, and cable news competing with the major outlets and covering events from various perspectives. More recently, the internet has multiplied the amount of information and viewpoints, with social media, blogs, and online video turning every citizen into a potential reporter. <coughs> but if everyone is a reporter, nobody is. And different sources may disagree not only on opinions, but on the facts themselves. So how do you get the truth? or something close. One of the best ways is to get the original news unfiltered by middlemen. Instead of articles interpreting a scientific study or a politician's speech, you can often find the actual material and judge for yourself. For current events, follow reporters on social media. During major events such as the Arab Spring or the Ukrainian protests, newscasters and bloggers have posted updates and recordings from the midst of the chaos. Though many of these later appear in articles or broadcasts, keep in mind that these polished versions often combine the voice of the person who was there with the input of editors who weren't. At the same time, the more chaotic the story, the less you should try to follow it in real time. In events like terrorist attacks and natural disasters, today's media attempts continuous coverage even when no reliable new information is available, sometimes leading to incorrect information or false accusations of innocent people. It's easy to be anxious in such events, but try checking for the latest information at several points in the day, rather than every few minutes, allowing time for complete details to emerge and false reports to be refuted. While good journalism aims for objectivity, media bias is often unavoidable. When you can't get the direct story, read coverage in multiple outlets, which employ different reporters and interview different experts. Tuning into various sources and noting the differences lets you put the pieces together for a more complete picture. It's also crucial to separate fact from opinion. Words like think, likely, or probably mean that the outlet is being careful, or worse, taking a guess. And watch out for reports that rely on anonymous sources. These could be people who have little connection to the story, or have an interest in influencing coverage, their anonymity making them unaccountable for the information they provide. Finally, and most importantly, try to verify news before spreading it. While social media has enabled the truth to reach us faster, it's also allowed rumors to spread before they can be verified, and falsehoods to survive long after they've been refuted. So before you share that unbelievable or outrageous news item, do a web search to find any additional information or context you might have missed, and what others are saying about it. Today we are more free than ever from the old media gatekeepers who used to control the flow of information. But with freedom comes responsibility, 
the responsibility to curate our own experience and ensure that this flow does not become a flood, leaving us less informed than before we took the plunge. Okay, um, any responses to that? Like when you are consuming news or information, do you care about the source that you're looking at? Do you consistently look to see what source, whether, you know, whether someone giving you the information is an official or just any old person, what the likelihood is you're going to get good information from them? Um, I suppose it depends on the, like, on how the information is being distributed. Like, if it's, uh, inf if it's like, uh, rumors, then uh, uh, not going to put too much emphasis on who's on where it's coming from. Just the fact that it's out is, uh, it is all that I'm interested in in uh, when addressing rumors. But when uh, talking about like, uh, uh, I don't know, fa uh, facts or so or social movements like. Uh, vetting your sources, I feel, is extremely important. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, uh, like if I'm reading up on a product launch, uh, I can really uh, am interested in just finding that information from anyone. Whereas if I'm doing research on a on something that I want to vote for next week, uh, no, I, I, that needs to be vetted through a lot of different processes and has mm -hmm. to be looked at from a lot of different angles. Cool. Okay, great. That's terrific. Um, and I would, you know, just the reason why I brought this up again for us to look at is that in your web package, you may be presenting additional information. Um, and so it's doubly important, I think, when you're not just the consumer uh, of information, but as we are so often, you know, we are the you know, a distribution point. We're redistributing information as you're going to do in your web package, basically. So as you redistribute information, you know, just I brought this up again just to say, you know, you have a responsibility for the content. Check it over, uh, whatever you might be using. Um, just see if you can corroborate and confirm the information that you uh, might be putting in. Um, most of, you know, all of the class topics that we're working on are not uh, earth-shaking, uh, you know, candidates for false news that's going to throw the election or anything like that. But um, we want to always exercise that discretion and care about verifying that what we put our name on and put into our work is going to be adequately sourced and, you know, something that's trustable. It's just I wanted to bring that up again because part of the web assignment is to provide additional information. Okay, so let's look back at the, um, the web assignment again because <clears throat> really it's the most important thing that we're doing and we want to make sure that um, everybody understands, hopefully. And as I said, I want to offer you an option, which is if you don't want to continue working on your own story with reporting, I have down here at the bottom of the page uh, some links which would allow you to do this without original reporting. So some people are just fed up with uh, their original reporting. Uh, other people, you know, didn't quite get it finished and so they, but they do want to move on. So let's just review again what, um, what's in the web package, which is uh, five parts. Uh, a 50 word summary of what the story is about. It could be very closely related or adapted from the lead of your story because we know that in the lead of your story you're going to try to put your main point and the most important facts. And so this would probably be a good point to put that there uh, because the blurbs also rate highly in SEO. So that's a little 50 word thing, separate. Uh, then your news story, which is adapted from your TV package, is basically the text of your TV package adapted for the web. And, uh, um, you know, using these 
specific web techniques that we talked about, and Chow just brought up one of the most important ones a second or two ago, or a few minutes ago. Um, so, whoops, just went down a little too much. So, web writing style, very short paragraphs, one or two sentences. Like if you're doing a quote, it is a separate paragraph by itself. And then your paraphrases, one or two sentences, is typically the length of a paragraph. Split your story into subsections with bold, easy to understand headlines. So, you know, no, no cute headlines here, no clickbait. Just tell them what they're going to find in each section because as readers move around, they um, uh, want to know where they're going to. Conversational language, just like we did from television, but now it must be grammatically correct. Active verbs, short sentences. So again, this is similar to the TV package, except it should be grammatically correct. No sentence fragments, for instance, which are fine when you're writing a script for something, someone to say, but not good in web writing. So go through your TV package sentence by sentence. Make sure that each sentence has a subject, a verb, an object, you know, somebody doing something, what they're doing, what it affects, subject, verb, object. Clean up spelling and grammar mistakes. You're obviously converting this into sentence case. So your um, word processor's uh, spell check will work on this, so use it. And then at the bottom of the story, add a few links to related web resources that are useful. And I just got finished saying, you know, try to link to credible websites, to major media um, that you recognize instead of somebody's blog. Uh, because you don't want to recirculate bad information. So exercise discretion on number six, okay? Um, so that is the big chunk of work that you got to do. And then there's a couple of smaller things. Uh, the next one is a web extra, which is just a little side story of 150 words that comes out to, you know, maybe 10 sentences or something. This is not a huge amount of extra writing that I'm asking for. Uh, so this should give some background information that your readers would want to hear about. So if you wrote about an event, consider profiling somebody who was involved with it. Uh, if you can find charts, graphs, or other information online that would give some context to what you're talking about, you could explore and interpret that in a 150-word web extra. It's just a little side story related but not incorporated in the main story that you got. And then uh, finally, uh, a web interactive feature, which might be those links that I mentioned up there, or it might be any of these other common interactive features that are in uh, web pages designed to get your audience more involved. So you could ask them questions in a survey, you could, or in a discussion forum where they could talk to each other. You could add a frequently asked ask questions uh, section. Uh, you could do um, uh, interactive games, which I've never had anyone propose a game, but that could be interesting. Or a calendar or uh, a Google map uh, of um, locations and stuff like that. So how this looks in an actual professional example, which I'm not saying you're exactly you know, doing this, but again, in the story on NBC Interactive about polluted groundwater, they include an interactive map of you know, some of the worst disposal ponds in the Central Valley, for instance. And you can you know, find, just to look at it, you can see how many of these there actually are and what a problem this could be for uh, you know, farmers and communities around them. Uh, I also asked for one graphic, so it could be a photograph or something. Uh, you don't have to do original picture. You could get it off the web. Uh, but there just should be one picture of in your story. Um, and so that's it. And this is all in the prompt. Um, there's an example that we um, have used. Uh, where is it? It's up in the modules, right? So uh, where's the example? Back in the module. Leland's farmer's market thing. Good lord. So there's an example page if this ever gets up, which is my problem, not the problem. There it is, web package, farmer's market. 
So this is what it looks like, um, an excellent example. Yours may not be as long as this, but it should have the pieces. There's a picture, there's the blurb, less than 50 words, that's fine. Tells us what's in the story. Um, here are the interactive links to other information. Notice that they all actually work. This is part of your job. It's not to say, I'm gonna put five links here. It's like, go search them out and find the, you know, the relevant stories and include them, okay? Uh, then here's Leland's main story. He's got a bunch of pictures he put in there, but you don't have to have extra pictures. It runs to, he's got more than 450 words. 450 words would be two pages, one, two. He's got a lot extra, but you don't have to have more than 450 words. There's the 150 word web extra, which is a profile of two organic farmers. And uh, you do not need the work cited. I should really just take that page off, um, but he's put it in. Okay, so um, let's see. Now that you've all seen it, any questions about this? Okay. Desiree is telling us of, um, yes, media literacy. Cool, I'm actually working on a course in media literacy, so I'm glad you guys think that's important. Okay, so now an option for people who are bored of their own story and would like to work on something different this time. You can do this same assignment using the materials that I have included here. Um, this is on the very pretty subject of the monarch butterfly. So it's a kind of science-based story, science and converse, con, conservation, uh, that you could use these materials to do the same above assignment if you don't feel like using your own stuff. So there's links here to a TV package script because this assignment is all about adapting your TV package, right? Well, here's a different TV package that you could adapt. Um, which is, uh, it's from a major network. I can't remember who Lester Holt used to work for. I think he works for CBS now on 60 Minutes. Um, so, you know, typically as a package would, he's on camera. Uh, the monarch butterfly was once a common sight throughout the United States. Now its reign is being threatened and the race is on to save the beautiful creature. But not everyone agrees in just how to do that. Here's NBC's Ann Thompson. So Holt has you know, done the anchor thing. And then this package begins with an SOT, actually, from uh, the noted expert on monarch butterflies, Karen Oberhauser. Well, it's really thinned out in here, hasn't it? So she's actually in action looking through um, uh, a, a forest where the monarchs usually are, um, you know, on their migration. And the reporter here says, the annual search for monarch butterflies is on in St. Paul, Minnesota. Back to Oberhauser. Did you find anything? And then they've got some other folks who are working with Oberhauser. Back to the reporter in VO. Usually abundant at this time of year, the creatures with wings like orange stained glass are disturbingly rare. And then she asks a question, so on and so forth. So that would be what you are adapting and you could be picking out your SOTs and turning them into quotes that way. Um, so, you know, if I was going to adapt this, the first thing I would do is I would run through and I would put quotes, you know, I, I'm not going to have SOTs of people going, no, nothing, nothing, but I'm going to take, you know, uh, the reporter saying, okay, the annual search for monarch butterflies is on in St. Paul, Minnesota, and the numbers are distressingly low. Usually abundant at this time of year, the creatures with wings like orange stained glass are disturbingly rare. You know, and then you're gonna write, Karen Oberhauser, noted expert on the monarch, um, says that this is a trend. And then you're gonna put in quotes, well, I'm certainly seeing a lot fewer monarchs, close quotes. And then you're going through this. So it really is that kind of adaptation. You're going through, you're selecting the SOTs, which are really important. You're putting quotes around them, and you're putting them out into a story, and you're using these as your paraphrase sections, basically. Okay, just as you would if this was your own TV package. 
all right? Um, now there's additional information here because you have to write a web extra. So once you're done adapting, you're also gonna want to dig in here and find additional information. <clears throat> so you could write about, you know, more, you know, the monarch bar butterfly all over the world. And you could take information from here about what's going on in New Zealand, what's going on in Mexico, stuff like that. Or later on, you could write about, you know, the life cycle of the monarch butterfly. So, you know, it says here the monarch's life cycle consists of three stages, such. So you take your information from here and from any other credible web source, and you choose a topic and you write 150 words about it. And of course, you are citing the source of this, which is uh, from Brandon Drucker. And here's the, you know, the entry on the monarch butterfly, right? With uh, the full publication information is at the bottom. So, uh, uh, you know, just give credit to um, as uh, the, you know, the source of this material. That's what we want. So that would get you enough to write your 150 word um, web uh, extra. Uh, where am I on? Back to the assignment, here we go. Um, and then you may want to write a profile of who Karen Overhauser is. So here's her, uh, a profile of her with information that you could turn into a 150 word web extra if you prefer to write about Oberhauser. <clears throat> so we learned from this that she um, um, supervises a, a very interesting, um, project of monitoring the monarch butterfly and she uses a lot of citizens as kind of scientific assistants. So high schools will make a, you know, a class project about doing their part of it and uh, community organizations, conservation organizations and stuff all over the United States are helping gather data about what's going on with the monarch butterfly. Um, so that's an interesting angle that you might want to get into there. You can find other links to uh, important stuff on the web. So, you know, if you find yourself getting held up because if you don't want to do your own story, you could do it with this stuff. And it's right here, right? You could go home tonight and write this and turn it in on time for November uh, 8th, right? Um, you don't have to, right? You can also do your own story. So you choose. But there's an option. And some people have been helped out by this. Um, so one thing that I wanted to show you in terms of, uh, you know, web interactives and some of the cool things that are happening now is um, a very low budget but very informative video about the monarch butterfly that may also, um, you know, inspire you to work on this topic. I'm not sure. It's, it's a little bit longer. Uh, but what I found so interesting about this is that it uses Google Earth to generate its imagery. Very low budget. And so I did a fundraiser video for my kids' school a year and a half ago. And I used Google Earth in the same way that they did. But I flew, I flew it over, you know, parts of San Francisco. And a friend of mine who's a producer said, hey, where'd you get the drone? And I said, no, it wasn't a drone. It was actually just, you know, using Google Earth. And you can get within about 150 feet of ground level. And you can fly, you know, you can tell it to go from one point to another in San Francisco. And you can output, you know, high definition video from it. And it fooled my friend. He thought it was uh, a, uh, he thought it was a drone, but of course, you know, none of the cars move. So anyway, uh, th that uses this technique to tell us a really cool story about the monarch which might, you know, give you context and inspire you to do the option that I just presented. So here it is. Our story starts here in the mountains of Michoacan in western Mexico in mid-February. This is Sierra Chinqua and Isabel Ramirez stands among the trees. Her orange outfit matches the monarch butterflies surrounding her. 
You can tell from her voice that she's a butterfly lover. They are beautiful. It's impossible not to be attracted by monarch butterflies. They provide a feeling of, of tranquility and peace and wonder. Ramirez is a geographer at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. She's working to conserve the forests of Michoacan inside the monarch butterfly biosphere reserve to prevent illegal logging for the sake of the trees and the butterflies. Because literally millions and millions of monarchs call this sanctuary home in the wintertime. Maybe around 50 million butterflies around us in this moment. And that's just in these couple acres. Monarchs coat the ground, the trees, and before long, Ramirez has a couple in her hands. I think they are small pieces of sunlight. Such a delicate animal, each one the weight of a paper clip. Now, as we approach the end of February, the peaks of Michoacan start warming up and the butterflies feel it. Sometimes a whole colony will pick up and settle back down together, literally moving from one location on the mountaintop to another. And by the middle of March, it's time for the monarchs to begin one of the most epic journeys in the animal kingdom. Their incredible migration is unparalleled. Karen Oberhauser has studied monarchs for 25 years. She's a biologist at the University of Minnesota. Now, to follow the monarch migration, we're going to fly along with the butterflies. And be sure to watch the timeline in the upper left. Okay, cue the epic journey music. and the females leave the overwintering colonies and fly north through Mexico. They cross the neovolcanic mountain range and, and cross the mountains on the east side of Mexico and fly up into southern Texas. The butterflies fan out, covering the southeastern quarter of the U.S., laying eggs as they go. If you imagine Monarchs is kind of this wave of insects that are moving northward and eastward. They're looking for specific kinds of habitat along the way. Habitat that must include milkweed. It's the only kind of plant that the caterpillars can eat, as well as other nectar sources for the adults. Now, let's pause for a moment here and consider the monarchs laying their little eggs on the milkweed. When Oberhauser described it to me, I was reminded just how astonishing that transformation is from egg into adult. We have this caterpillar that's kind of like a worm. They're this earthbound thing that's kind of squishy and kind of mushy. And then they go through this transformation where it's almost like they die when they get into the chrysalis. So they're in this stage that, from the outside at least, they, they don't even look alive. And then they transform into this incredibly beautiful organism that throws off the chains of the earth and is able to, to fly away. Okay, back to the journey. The butterflies from Mexico live no more than a month after leaving their overwintering mountaintops and laying their eggs. And so it's this next generation, born in the southeastern U.S. in what's called their spring range, that pick up the next chapter of the migration which goes northward into what we call their summer breeding range. So this is everything kind of from a line through the middle of the United States up into southern Canada. The migration is filled with peril. Butterfly eggs are gobbled down by ants and spiders and wasps. Most animals avoid eating the adult monarchs because they taste bad, but there are a couple types of birds that do find them palatable. The black-headed grosbeak and the black-backed oriole. Then there's bad weather. A drought or a really bad storm can decimate the monarch numbers. But perhaps the biggest threat on their journey these days is habitat destruction. And that habitat consists of milkweed. The middle of the United States used to be one big prairie. And all of that land was suitable habitat. We now have a patchwork of cities and agricultural fields broken up by by completely inappropriate habitat, which would be things like roads and parking lots. 
Oberhauser told me that cities aren't necessarily bad for monarchs. Take Minneapolis, where residents have planted milkweed and other butterfly-friendly plants in parks, lawns, and gardens. Still, a city means a lot less monarch habitat than before. Agricultural fields used to be okay, with lots of milkweed mingling with the crops. But now, in this age of genetically modified corn and soybeans, farmers spray their fields with herbicides that wipe out the milkweed. All this disrupted habitat makes the going much tougher for the monarchs, and over the last few years, their numbers are down. But there are still many butterflies that do make it, that find milkweed, and that lay more eggs. They go through two or three more generations in the northern part of their range, breeding, laying eggs, finding milkweed plants, and then after about August 15th, the butterflies fly south again to the overwintering sites in Mexico. Yeah, it's incredible. No one butterfly completes the whole journey. And for those of you keeping score, it takes up to four generations to finish the full migration, to leave Mexico and to get back again. Now, that's just one part of the story, the story told from the butterfly's point of view. But over the course of their journey, those butterflies come in contact with a kind of human army, thousands of citizen scientists, everyday people allowing us to get to know these monarchs better and help them out along their way. So let's rewind the clock to September, once the butterflies have begun flying south again. We're going to zoom in here on Cape May, New Jersey, where Mark Garland is a naturalist. We get an abnormal number of monarchs here because we're the very southern tip of New Jersey and the land is literally tapering like a funnel. And as these butterflies migrate, they're much more comfortable over land than water. So they stay over land and get funneled uh, down into Cape May proper. Literally, when there's a lot of monarchs around, they're everywhere. We laugh. Sometimes you feel like you're inside an orange snow globe. But Garland doesn't just watch the monarchs. He tags them. It's part of a citizen science project run out of the University of Kansas called Monarch Watch. The tagging involves small adhesive stickers that are put on the wings of a monarch butterfly. The size of the sticker is about the same as your little finger nail. By the time you catch it, put the sticker on and let it go. It's 30 seconds if you're good, if you've been doing it a long time. That's Garland's wife, Paige Cunningham. She's a naturalist and educator, and she told me that before she lets the butterflies go, she whispers to them. Sometimes I'm just like, have a good journey. Sometimes I wish them good luck. I don't always know what I'm gonna say to them until I have them in my hand. I don't know, it's like a secret in a bottle or a wish, or a hope, or a dream, or something, and then it flies away. Cunningham and Garland recruit a bunch of people, and each year the team dots hundreds of butterfly wings with these tiny sticker tags. On the tag is a unique code of three letters and three numbers, like the social security number of the butterfly. And it's this social security number here that can be used to track the butterflies along their migration route, where other people catch them and read off the code. Every time a tagged monarch is found somewhere else, you've connected the dots on migration. We found monarchs here in Cape May that have been tagged in New York State and Pennsylvania and other parts of New Jersey. And the butterflies routing through Cape May have been found as far south as Florida and Texas, even Mexico. And there have been a few New Jersey monarchs that the wind's blown out to the Bahamas. Now, some of the butterflies pass through Georgia, where Mary Beth Carey teaches the fifth grade in the town of Sylvester. I want the students to use the butterflies to connect with and go beyond the boundaries of our town. For the last few years, she and her students have been taking scotch tape, placing it on monarch butterfly abdomens, peeling it off, and sending it to the University of Georgia. That's where a program called Monarch Health counts up the number of external parasites on the butterflies to figure out how healthy they are. Harry's students love being part of the butterflies' lives. I really like working with insects. We should help them. As the butterflies flutter along, countless people are on the lookout, entering their sighting locations, and some of them recorded themselves to tell us about their encounters, all the way from Brackettville, Texas. Right now, I'm surrounded by trees with beautiful arcing limbs. The butterflies, I can't believe they're still here. I'm so excited. To Vermont, where the state butterfly is the monarch. 
When I was little, my mom would buy me the Grow a Monarch Butterfly kit, and we would watch them in our house until they grew up, and then we would set them free. To Wisconsin. Butterflies are beautiful, and they are wonderful. To North Carolina. I've been watching monarchs all my life. My wife came up with the theme of monarchs for our wedding. On our custom-made cake topper, the bride and groom chased a monarch hand-in-hand with the groom holding a butterfly net. You get the idea. Monarch butterfly lovers are everywhere. So let's return to the end of the monarch journey one more time. As the butterflies make their way back towards Mexico, they gather into thicker and thicker ribbons as they fly. By the time they hit Texas, the monarchs stop people in their tracks. They cluster up in these pecan trees like grapes and just are draped everywhere. As you walk down the the river trail, they just erupt in these butterfly clouds of orange. My house looks out onto the sunset in Mexico, seeing hundreds of thousands of monarchs almost flowing like a river through the sky. That river flows back into Mexico, winding around the mountaintops to settle down for another winter. It's a river of orange sunshine that graces the people it passes, and many of those people reach out to touch that river and to hold, if even for a moment, a single butterfly in their hands. I see the structure a little bit. Of what they did? Yeah. Uh, um, but. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's obviously way longer than anything we do, but uh, I just think it's an interesting uh, approach to, um, you know, low-budget video making for nonprofits and such. <clears throat> but I put it up there just really for content to see if, uh, because not everybody knows much about monarch butterflies, so I thought eh, it might inspire some people to actually do this project on the butterflies and even that aspect of Oberhauser's work, which intersects with the citizen scientist thing. I mean, again, uh, I always get really uh, enthusiastic when I hear about kids getting involved in anything that's bigger than themselves or video games and stuff like that. So thought that was a great dimension of it so as I said you're not required to and if you feel like it you could do it on this uh, information instead of doing it on your own original reporting I'm happy to give you that option so uh, you make your choice and uh, this is now due on uh, November 8th right with a little extension thanks for uh, our midterm elections putting that off. How can we submit a video with the project? No video. This is a writing course. So, uh, I don't know why that doesn't show up. Uh, so, uh, there is no video to submit for this. You are giving in, in fact, a web package that, uh, that looks exactly like this or as close to this as you, you know, feel like making it. It's got too many pictures and stuff. But uh, the what we're doing is we are adapting uh, a TV package. We're adapting a video down into uh, a, uh, a web page, basically. So um, thank you for that question, though. Periodically, I get it. Like, um, you know, we don't produce anything. We just write scripts. So in this case, you are doing the same thing. Uh, but instead of adapting your own TV package into a web page, you're adapting somebody else's TV package into the web page, and uh, there it is. So uh, that's that's this part of the story. Okay. Um, so uh, we're a week off from that, 
and uh, you know again this could take a little bit longer if it's your own um, uh, your own reporting that's involved but you know I'd say uh, maybe two two and a half hours to gather together the parts of this and then write it I think would probably be about what you need. I wouldn't do it all on the seventh before that. okay so um, cool okay well let's finish five minutes early so we can all uh, get some more sleep <laughs> all right see you next week um, if I don't see you before Tuesday, I encourage you to vote again. I guess I already said that.